Jake Scheinkoff. Uh, we'll just speak about the economy and politics, politics the economy. Uh, <coughs> I'm the firm here in New York, a good friend called Scheinkoff and Associates. So first of all, I'll tell you that while Hank is a smart guy, will sound like a professor. Uh, he's a practicing, practices what he preaches. So if you need somebody, if you have somebody with issues, problems, good things, bad things in politics and communications, Hank is for hire um, for the right issues and the interesting. Um, Hank is working a lot of different things. Um, part of the Clinton re-election campaign for the president. Got a um, number of New York State officials elected, international people elected. He's on CNN. He's the CNN correspondent. So if you turn on CNN, Hank is the is a talking, the talking head there. Um, and he's a good friend and a mentor, most importantly. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, um, How many reporters are here besides the WB11? I know what I'm doing. Okay, sorry. Um, when I when I don't want something uh, noted, I will make the mention. Or maybe I won't. I'll see how I think. We want to talk about politics this morning. Is there anything else you need to know about me about why you have to get up at this hour in the morning to get here in the rain? <laughs> I've worked in 46 states and 10 foreign countries, and I'm a former presidential advisor. And um, I, this business, the, politi the political business, allowed me to see America and see the world, frankly. I would not have had that opportunity, and it's changed my way of thinking about things a lot over the last uh, 35 years that I've been doing it. Um, I'm an academically trained political scientist, so I have a pretty significant and different viewpoint than most of my colleagues do about it. And my sense about where this country is going, Weisenfeld here has heard me talk about it, and I've talked about it in public. Uh, Speaking for those of you who've listened over the last four years, I predicted the, this, the economic crisis, but certainly not with the intensity that I was right about. I was wrong when I said Hillary would win the uh, presidency, but I was right when I said Barack Obama would win Hillary, and I said it on CNN. So how do we get to this point? Are you interested in how we got to this point in American politics over the last? This didn't happen yesterday. This is a full, this is really a process that's going on for quite some time. And if you want to put it in the context of the moment, we got to this point. At, uh, but September 26, 2008, really in the 60s, something happened that is unusual and interesting. Um, that doesn't account for religious trends in American politics, which if you are a serious student of why religion is as important as it is, you don't have to look at the fundamentalists and say, oh, or yay, depending upon your point of view. You need to look at, at the Civil War and the pre-Civil War and the founding of the nation to understand the nature of, of, of Christian fundamentalism and why it's so important to this country and why it's a staple of our politics. But that is for another day, I guess. What is important today is how we got here. We got here because um, since, 19, since Nixon ran for president as the true middle class candidate in 1968, and the first of his kind probably in the 20th century, uh, he was able to put together a coalition of Southern Protestants and Northern Catholics, something that had never been done before. And, um, and it's kind of unique when you consider that the history of, again, coming back to religion, that the nature of religion in American politics as a, uh, not as a joiner, but a divider, is rather significant. And Nixon puts this coalition together of Catholics and Protestants who hate each other, the Ku Klux Klan and others coming from the Deep South, fundamentalist Christianity, the North being Catholics in the Midwest, particularly, who became Democrats in 1928 because Al Smith, then the governor of New York, ran for president. And the headlines and papers across the country talked about Al Smith as for wrong Romanism and rebellion, how he would bring pap the pap papacy to the United States and destroy our freedom. Pretty extreme and remindful of, of no nothing party and things like that for those of you students in history leading up to the Civil War. But anyway, Al Smith runs, Catholics become Democrats. They stay there until 1968. Nixon runs for president in a post riot world, post urban unrest world. He says he's the one. He introduces really negative campaign, campaign tactics into the American lexicon. He becomes the president, and that iron triangle, I like to call it, of Southern Protestants and Northern Catholics stays in place. So if you look at presidential activity and presidential ads and spending, what you see since 1968 is that in contested races, it always gets down to 500,000 white Catholic men, and they're all in one thing. This is a perfect voter. A billion dollars will be spent to convince 500,000 people that they need to do something. They're in the center, and they haven't moved. They're in the same places. Well, this is the last time they're going to matter. <clears throat> because of the changing nature of our economy, but the perfect voter is a 45-year-old plus white Catholic, largely white to Catholic, largely white, excuse me, white, largely Catholic male, lives in uh, Michigan, Missouri, Ohio, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, 
he or his uh, he or his uh, father, let's see, his grandfather or his father served in Vietnam and or Korea. Okay, so he's invested in what goes on around him. Symbolism becomes very important. He is, uh, let's see, he, either he or his, um, or somebody within three or four degrees is a member of the United Automobile Workers, the Teamsters, and the Building Trades. He's not a private public sector worker. He can trace his roots back to the inner cities of the Midwest, like I said. He believes in a part of his brain, because there is no rationality in time or space in politics, that he still lives in those inner cities. And he's angry about that he's not there. But he's replicated his culture in the suburbs of those inner cities in the Midwest, where he now lives. So the VFW Hall, the KSC Hall, the Masonic Lodge, um, you name it, it's the churches, the parish movement, they're all there. You know, and it's pretty significant. He's got to be stable because the Catholic canon law requires, church canon law requires, that the, that the sacrament take place in a specific location defined by the church, which is not movable. People in that world can tell you what parish they grew up in, and, and that's how they define their lives. So he's had to replicate all that. He's a pretty serious guy. He hadn't left much. And his culture is dependent to a large extent about the industry that he works in. And he is connected to the oil industry in some fashion, by and large, or something to do with something that we don't think about here in New York at this table or the kind of offices we're in today. He's the guy. He joins with those people in the South, and he creates that kind of tight lock on things, because we know that New York, California are going to vote Democrat unless there's, even if there's an assassination or something, he's still going to vote Democrat. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. Just, uh, certain immutable facts. It's like when you buy a cup of coffee in New York from a street vendor, you're going to get a wet napkin on top of it. And what did you do? There are immutable facts. That being said, he's going to do that, and Catholics, those Catholic men are going to try and figure out what they're going to do now, and they kind of like John McCain because he's more reflective of their values. Now, I did the in-state campaign in 2000 for the United, United Automobile Workers for Gore and Lieberman who were absolutely wrong on every issue for the target population I'm talking about. But Gore and Lieberman won the state because I found the enemy. The enemy was George Bush. The problem is there is no enemy here. So you say to yourself, well, what does this have to do with present politics? It has an awful lot to do with present politics. If you look at how Senator Clinton did in the primary, so you look at how she did with the target group I'm talking about, she did pretty darn good consistently across the board, okay? She tended not to do well, uh, and that would be the case, in states where there were large African-American populations, which you would suspect, and that would be normal. Um, and that, and you know, and if I were black and I saw Barack Obama, boy, I'd be proud to sell, and I'd be jumping up and down to get him elected president of the United States. That's all well and good. But the Democratic Party, as people think about it, is not a party. It's essentially it's essentially a group of people that keep trying to get those same 500,000 white men back. They lost them. And that's been the battle. The only guy who's done it successfully is Bill Clinton. He didn't do it in the election, he did it in the re-election. If you remember, in January 1995, after the loss of the House of Representatives and the Senate, he was down 35 points. So he successfully recaptured that movie, but nobody else has really done it since on the, Republic, on, the, on the Democratic side of the aisle. Is it about values, or is it about something that we don't see? It's about, um, it pokes holes in the argument that blue-collar people don't vote their own interests, because obviously they see their interests as voting Republican at this point. Now, the shifts, that shifted somewhat in particular elections. It did in 2004 in Michigan, for example, when the Democrats started winning back local offices. But symbolism still becomes the most important part of the equation. And, 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 and that does not disinclude race. What are the symbols involved? Well, John McCain decides that he's not going to go to this debate. And, and I, was, I was interviewed about that the minute it happened. I said, look, it's pretty darn smart. And Democrats are yelling at me, you're an idiot. I said, no, I am an idiot, but this is pretty smart. <laughs> the reason why it's smart from a PR perspective, which is something I know something about, is that it makes him into the hero of the moment, which is exactly what those 500,000 guys want to see. He's the hero who can rise above politics. Whether it's true or not is not important. Truth in politics does not matter. Victory does. <laughs> people say anything. I mean, I know that's, that's awful to say it, but people on both sides of the aisle talk about how, what their morals are, frankly, really don't care. I mean, some, I did an interview this morning, and somebody said to me, well, John McCain took the moral position. I said, that's absolute happy crap. What he did was, he took the position that was best to knock down the overnights and the AP Washington, and excuse me, the Washington Post and ABC poll that showed him down by nine, and he, and he stopped the hemorrhaging. But Ed Cox, who's the McCain guy in New York City, said, but Hank, he said, you don't understand. I said, what's that? He said, that's not John McCain. I said, that's John McCain. Look, they're fighting over the president.